Welcome to our look ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series has proved to be a very interesting one entitled, In the Crucible with Christ. This is lesson number 11 in that series entitled, Waiting in the Crucible. It's a lesson for September 10 of 2022. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we recognize that crucibles are not fun. And so many times down through history, Christians have had problems because of crucibles. Now help us to understand why it's important sometimes for us to wait. Even though we're waiting for something that's really good, we still might have to wait. And think of how long you have waited for certain events to take place. Bless us now as we discuss together these issues is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Is waiting an important part of building character? Well, our Bible study guide suggests scientists did an experiment with four-year-old children. Now, you know that four-year-old children are not the champion waiters. And the experiment was with marshmallows. Each child was told by a scientist that they could have a marshmallow. However, if the child waited until the scientist returned from an errand, they would be given two. Some of the children stuffed the marshmallow into their mouths the moment the scientists left. <laughs> Others waited. The differences were noted. The scientists then kept track of these children into their teenage years. This is a long-term study. <laughs> The ones who had waited turned out to be better adjusted, better students, and more competent than those who didn't. Hmm, wonder what led to that. It seemed that patience was indicative of something greater, something important in the human character. It, it is no wonder then that the Lord tells us to cultivate it from our Bible study guide for Sabbath afternoon. So why is it so difficult to be patient and to wait? Why do we sometimes have to wait so long for things we, we know are right? What should, be, what should we be learning as we wait? Romans 15, 4 and 5 suggests that we can gain hope as we patiently wait. Does that sound like something that is fun to do? Look at those verses for just a moment here. Everything written in the scripture was written to teach us in order that we might have hope through the patience and encouragement which the scriptures give us. And may God, the source of patience and encouragement, enable you to have the same point of view, sorry, I need to, uh, among yourselves by following the example of Christ Jesus, so that all of you together may praise with one voice the God of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what does that teach us? We can gain hope as we patiently wait. We gain hope as we patiently wait. Does that sound like something that's fun to do? It has been reported that someone once prayed, Lord, I need patience, and I need it right now. <laughs> waiting, patience, waiting patiently isn't easy. Jim? The Bible study guide says, waiting is painful by definition. In Hebrew, one of the words for wait patiently in Psalms 37, verse seven of the New King James Version, comes from a Hebrew word that can be translated, quote, to be much pained, to share, to tremble, to be wounded, to be sorrowful. Learning patience is not easy. Sometimes it's the very essence of what it means to be in the crucible from the Bible study guide for September 4. And of course, we're talking about what it means to be in the crucible. Learning patience is not easy either. Isn't that what is suggested by what it means to be in the crucible? What are born, we are born impatient. Small babies have no patience at all. They are only aware of their immediate needs. At what point are we supposed to learn patience? We have discussed in the past that faith is the only requirement for salvation. That's what Paul and Silas told the jailer, remember there in Philippi. Does waiting patiently help us develop trust and faith? Do you find that trouble produces endurance and endurance brings God's approval, which in turn brings hope 
as suggested by Romans 3, 5, 3 to 5. So what should we be doing while we are waiting? We basically have two choices. One, we can focus on what we are waiting for, which tends to make us impatient. Or two, we can focus on the one who holds those things in his hands, which should make us more patient and trusting. The real difference is based on our attitude. Do we really believe that God will do what is best for us and when it is, and when it is best for us? Sometimes it's hard to believe that. Does surrender to the Lord produce patience? Is it wrong to be impatient for the second coming? That, I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Think how long God has waited for various things to happen. Romans 5, 6 and Galatians 4, 4 suggest that God waited for thousands of years until he sent his son to this world at the right time. Carrie? And they've got uh, BSG there. The Bible study guide. Right. In these verses, Paul tells us that Jesus came to die for us at exactly the right time. But Paul does not tell us why it was the right time. It is very easy to read these verses and wonder, why did Jesus wait for thousands of years until he came to the earth to deal with sin? Didn't the universe understand that sin was a very bad thing long before then? We may ask why Jesus is waiting to come the second time as well. We also may ask, why is the Lord waiting so long to answer my prayer? <laughs> yeah. Comes from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Monday, September 5. None of us have ever asked the question, why is the Lord waiting so long to answer our prayers, right? <clears throat> <clears throat> the Jews who were supposed to be the lights of the world had instead become so self-righteous and their religious requirements so impossible to keep that very few Gentiles were attracted to the true worship of God. After falling into the pit of heathenism and fertility cult worship in the Old Testament, the Jews of the New Testament have become super, so super religious, it doesn't mean very good, but super, so stuck on their religious rules that they repelled non-Jews. In effect, they had demonstrated that, quote, the ditch on either side of the road was just as bad and just as misrepresentative of the truth about God as Satan could make it. And Desire of Ages, the first three chapters, pages 27 to 49, spell that out. It's just amazing what she says about the times when Jesus was about to come to this earth. Well, there's other times that God waited, Dwayne? Think about the 70-week prophecy of Daniel. No, chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. The prophecy that points to Jesus as the Messiah. Review it if you need to. Okay, let's just talk about that for just a second. 70-week prophecy, how long a period is that? 490 years. We believe that a day stands for a year in, the, in prophetic terms, so 70 times 7 would be 490 days, which would mean 490 years. That's quite a long time to wait. Okay, go ahead. How long was that time period? Well, 490 years. Mm -hmm. um, what does this tell you about learning to wait for things in God's time, even if it takes what seems to us a long time? Again, from our Bible study guide. Through Daniel, the Jews were told that they would be given another 490 years from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem, which we can date to the year 457 BC, to see if things would improve. And what happened? Did things get a lot better? No. no. They made 400 some rules for Sabbath keeping only. Even more than that, depending yeah. on how you divide them up, yeah. Daniel saw a number of visions of the future. And you wonder, it's interesting that God chose to send him so many different visions. Each of those visions involves significant time periods. Think of the 70-year prophecy in Daniel 9, 24 to 27. I'm sorry, that should be 70-week prophecy. Predicting the ultimate fate of Jewish people as a nation. Consider also the prophecy of 20, I'm sorry. There was first a 70-year prophecy, that's correct, but it's not the one in Daniel 9, it's the one in Jeremiah uh, 29. 
Consider also the prophecy of 2300 days or years extending all the way to 1844, the beginning of the pre-advent judgment. Both Daniel and John in Revelation saw visions of the 1260-day prophecy from 538 to 1798. So why is it necessary for God to give these long time periods to Daniel way back in his day? I mean, wouldn't that be just, wouldn't that just discourage you? If they knew, if they really understood him, it might have. But okay, you think they didn't understand them? No, they didn't. Okay, Gordon? Did even Daniel understand it? Well, that's a good question. From the Bible Study Guide, again, <laughs> there are many important spiritual reasons why we all experience waiting times. First, waiting can refocus our attention away from things and back to God himself. Second, waiting allows us to develop, to develop a clearer picture of our own motives and desires. Third, waiting builds perseverance, spiritual stamina. Fourth, waiting opens the door to develop many spiritual strengths such as faith and trust. Fifth, waiting allows God to put down other pieces in the puzzle of the bigger picture. Sixth, we may never know the reason we have to wait, hence, we learn to live by faith. Can you think of any other reasons for waiting? What examples can you find in the Bible of God doing things in his own time that can help you learn to trust that he will do for you what's right in his own time as well? Think for instance about Abraham and Sarah and the promise of a son. They weren't willing to wait. How long, how long was it from the time they were given that promise until they finally got their son, do you know? Over 20 years, yeah. wasn't it? 25 years. And long past the time when they were supposed to have children. Yeah. <coughs> well, okay. Sarah tried to help. Sarah Abraham tried to help. Tried, Abraham tried to help, too. <laughs> yeah. Continuing with the Bible study guide, at the same time, ask yourself, what might I be doing that could be delaying the answer to a prayer that could have been answered long ago from the Bible study guide for Monday? Can you think of an example why that, of that, something that we might be involved with? Yes. I think we are the greatest um, um, hostage takers. <laughs> okay, Myra? You're going to tell us about one of the great problems. Okay. From the writings of Ellen G. White. Had Adventists, after the great disappointment in 1844, held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, receiving the message of the third angel and the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaiming it to the world, they would have seen the salvation of God. The Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts. The work would have been completed, and Christ would have come ere this to receive his people. To Notice those words, ere this. Now let's see when that happened, when she said that. Go ahead. But in a period of doubt and uncertainty that followed the disappointment, many of the Advent believers yielded their faith, thus the work was hindered and the world was left in darkness. Had the whole Adventist body united, into the command, united upon the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, how widely different the world would have been our history. Okay. Is oh, do you want me to continue? I'm sorry. Okay, please. Okay. It was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be thus delayed. God did not design that his people, Israel, would wander 40 years in the wilderness. He promised to lead them directly into the land of Canaan, to establish them there a holy, healthy, happy people. But those whom it was first, it was first preached went not in because of unbelief. Their hearts were filled with murmuring, rebellion, and hatred and could not fulfill his covenant. He could not fulfill his covenant with them. For 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out the ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. 
it's amazing that they ever got there. Yeah. The same sins have delayed the entrance to the modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. Yes, okay. Neither, in neither case, were the promises of God at fault. It was the unbelief, the worldliness, unconsecration, and strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. And when was that written? Manuscript number four in 1883. 1883. We should have been in heaven before this. It's almost 140 years ago. Yep. Is anybody disappointed that sitting on this table? We're not selfish enough to be thankful that it didn't happen, are we? Yeah. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> you know, get puffed up a little bit. I mean, a little bit, huh? We wouldn't, have the, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Yeah. That's right. The close of probation will not take place until everyone on this earth has had a chance to make a reasonable choice about which side in the great controversy she or he wants to be on. Then Jesus will leave heaven and come to claim his, his, claim his own. Now this is very opposed to what commonly is believed by many, many people. There's a lot of people who think, up, think that God is up there and all of a sudden he's going to say, okay, bam, close probation. Well, let's look and see what Ellen White says about that. Charles? A crisis is right upon us. Um, we <clears throat> must now, by the Holy Spirit's power, proclaim the great truths for these last days. It will not be long before everyone will have heard the warning and made his decision. Then shall the end come. Ellen White Testament is to cry for the church, volume 6. Page 24. Okay, what has to happen before the end will come? Everyone will have heard the warning and made his decision. Is that, does that mean an active decision? Or could it be a passive decision that I'm not going to make a decision? Okay. And that's the decision. Let's look at the next quotation that might help us with that. When the third angel's message closes, Mercy no longer pleads for the guilty inhabitants of the earth. The people of God have accomplished their work. They have received the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, and they are prepared for the trying hour before them. Angels are hastening to and fro in heaven. The angel returning from the earth announces that his work is done. The final test has been brought upon the world. And all who have proved themselves loyal to divine precepts have received the seal of the living God. Okay, I'm going to interrupt there for, na for, for a moment. What is the criteria for the close of probation? Sealing has happened. The sealing has happened. What, how does that, how does that fit time-wise with other events? What does this just tell us? The angels are checking things all around the earth. And I don't know exactly how they work together, but one of them finally reports to heaven that everyone has made up their choice, made their choice, and those who have chosen for God's side have been what? Sealed. Yeah. Sealed. Okay. So who is making? Who is going to determine when the close of probation happens? We are, collectively, as a human race. Mm -hmm. Then, God. God is waiting. He's waiting. Okay, Charles, go ahead. Then Jesus, but then Jesus causes his ceases. ceases his intercession in the sanctuary above. He lifts his hands and with a loud voice says, it is done. Just like in the cross, it is finished, mm -hmm. it is done. And all the angelic hosts lay off their crowns as he makes the solemn announcement. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Revelation 22, okay. verse 11. Okay, I'm going to interrupt again. So we decide the close of probation by doing what? Making a decision. Are we going to be righteous, holy, filthy, unjust? Every case is, oh, go ahead. 
Every case has been decided for life or death. Christ has made the atonement for his people and bottled out, blotted out their sins. The number of his subjects is made up. The kingdom and the dominion, the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven is about to be given to the heirs of salvation and Jesus is to reign as King of kings and the Lord of lords. When he leaves the sanctuary, darkness covers the inhabitants of the earth. In that fearful time, the righteous must live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. Okay, hold on, I'm gonna interrupt again. What does it mean for the righteous to live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor? What does that mean? Well, someone did it on the cross. Yes, okay. Anybody, any, can you think of any other examples? in the Bible, from the Bible. Did Job kind of do that? Job was described by God as faithful and righteous, wasn't he? Yeah. And even Noah was described as being faithful. Okay, so it's possible from a human perspective for that to happen, okay? Go ahead. Where was I? Probation. The world has rejected his mercy. Was that there? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. The world has rejected his mercy, despised his love, and trampled upon his law. Well, that has happened a long time ago. Trampled on the law. The wicked have passed the boundary of their probation. The Spirit of God persistently resisted and has been at last withdrawn. Unsheltered by the divine grace, they have no protection for the, from the wicked one. Satan will then plunge the inhabitants of the earth into one great final trouble. Okay, I'm gonna interrupt again. Who plunges the earth into the seven last plagues? Satan. Satan does. Yeah. These are not God, and you people superficially reading Revelation 15 might get the impression that God is the one who sends the seven last plagues. No, it's Satan who sends the seven last plagues. Okay, go ahead. Again, it is not the act of God. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> As the angels of God cease to hold in check the fierce winds of human passion, all the elements of strife will be let loose. The whole world will be involved in ruin more terrible than that which came upon Jerusalem of the old. Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 613. Okay. Let us be very clear. We are not waiting for God. God is waiting for us. Fortunately, there's nothing wrong with God's patience. <laughs> so thankful for that. What do you think of when you think about people waiting for significant periods of time for what they had believed God was, God was going to do something? The greatest wait of all is for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Could we be doing something to help answer the prayer that his coming could be soon? One person who waited patiently for God to do what he had promised was David. A still young man herding sheep in the hills near Bethlehem, he was anointed by Samuel to be the next king of Judah. Did he demand that the promise be fulfilled immediately? Not at all. 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 13 details the time when Samuel came and after reviewing all of the other sons of Jesse, asked if there was still one more son. Jesse called David from the field. In other words, he's the youngest son of the family. All these sparkling, shining, tall, erstwhile young men passed up by God. Well, there was one more out there still herding sheep from the field. In secret, he was anointed to be the next king of Judah. I mean, I... When I, when I read a story like that, I, you know, I had only one brother. He was a good brother. But I, I know stories of families, of, of large families. Can you imagine someone coming to a large family, say, I'm here to anoint the next king of Judah. Not you, not you, not you, not you, not you, not, da, 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 da. The la oh, well, there's one still out in the field, call him. Oh, you, you're gonna be the next king. What kind of sibling 
<laughs> effects would that cause? Yeah. Similar to Joseph. Joseph. <laughs> Sounds like a Joseph story, doesn't it? Similar to Cain and Abel. Yeah, Cain and Abel, yeah. <coughs> well, <coughs> briefly review the events that took place between the anointing of David and his finally becoming king. And here we just uh, go, run through the, the, the events very quickly. First, the lad is called to play music to soothe Saul's, soothe Saul's troubled spirit, 1 Samuel 16. Later, he becomes Israel's hero as he kills Goliath, 1 Samuel 17. Then there are many years during which David is running for his life. Both Saul and his son Jonathan know that David uh, is destined to be the next king, 1 Samuel 23, 17 and 1 Samuel 24, 20. But David does nothing to advance his God-given destiny. I mean, you know that God has chosen you to be the next king. Shouldn't you pursue that goal? Gotta uh, help God out. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, he appears to do the opposite. Even when Saul tries to kill him and David snips a piece of cloth off the king's robe, he wishes he had never done such a thing. 1 Samuel 24, 5 to 7. Again, when Saul is trying to kill David, David refuses to kill Saul when the opportunity arises. 1 Samuel 26, 7 to 11. Wow. Did David have patience? Would you call that a crucible? I mean, for, remember for quite a while he had to escape out of Judah and into, into the air territory of the Philistines just to survive from Saul. Well, think of the incredible story of David. He took some food to his brothers at the battlefield and ended up killing Goliath and cutting off his head and carrying it around wherever he went for the rest of the day. <laughs> I don't know how that story strikes you. Here's this kid, young kid, strapping guy, comes here, and here's this army that had been standing there listening to Goliath's challenges for who knows how long. And David says, why are we just standing here listening to this guy? Why didn't somebody take care of him? Huh? <laughs> Who's the big, tall king of the place? Saul, what's he doing? Is he out there fighting with Goliath? Not on your life. So of course we know the story. David walks down there with his sling and his few stones and But he said, I come in the name of my heavenly father. Yep. So he walked with him in the wilderness. You know, yep. Here. So that was the difference. And then David throws that stone, he charges, and the guy topples over, and David runs up and says, here, there's a hand, sword handy here, great big heavy sword, cut off his head. I mean, I don't know. Gordon, you, wa you watch surgeries all day along with, with people with very sharp knives. Can you imagine? They don't cut off heads. <laughs> they don't cut off heads. I mean, you got bones in there, and other things, I mean, this isn't an easy job. But he cut off his head, big heavy head. Okay, folks. And by the time he picks up his head, what else is happening? The Philistines were running as fast as they could. And the Jews, oh, I guess, yeah. <laughs> chase them, guys, chase them. <laughs> but we must also remember that he was, here was a young man who killed a lion. Yeah, and a bear. And a bear. Yeah. And don't st steal my ship. What? I'm going to get you. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, why would I be afraid of Goliath? I've done bigger, lions and bears, right? Bigger than that, yes. What would you think if you saw David carrying this big old head around all day? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I've wondered many times what the instrument was exactly that he killed him with because there's two or three ways of looking at that. Yeah. It's your catapult and it seemed like it was this thing and he, he yeah. let one half go. Well, yeah. Once you do that, that thing's going to fly anywhere, I would have thought. Well, David knew how to make it go in the way he wanted it to go. Yeah. He practiced it every day, you know, come yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, Look at 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 11. Jim, can you read that for us? 
26, verse chapter I'm sorry, 26. 26, 1 to 11. Some men from Ziph came to Saul at Gibeah and told him that David was hiding on Mount Hakla, Hakla, mm -hmm. Hakla, Hakla, at the edge of the Judean desert, the wilderness, excuse me. Saul, I'm sorry. Let me try that again. There you go. Saul went at once with 300 of the best soldiers in Israel to the wilderness of Ziph to look for David and camped by the road on Mount Hakila, Hak or something. Mm -hmm. David was still in the wilderness, and when he learned that Saul had come to look for him, he sent spies and found out that Saul was indeed there. He went at once and located the exact place where Saul and Abner, son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, slept. Saul slept inside the camp and his men camped around him. Verse six, then David asked Ahimelech, the Hittite, and Abishai, the brother of Joab, their mother was Zeri Zeriah, Zer Zeriah, which of you two will go to Saul's camp with me? I will, Abishai answered. Now let's, let me just stop for a second. Who are Abishai and, and uh, who was the other one there? Joab? These were cousins, brothers or cousins of, of David. And he's, you know, he's out there, he's a, he's a fugitive. He says, I found out, he found out somehow or other exactly where the Saul is sleeping. And so he, he asked these relatives of his, who, which one of you is willing to go with me? Okay, so that night, go ahead. Verse seven. So that night David and Abishai entered Saul's camp and found Saul sleeping in the center of the camp with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. Abner and the troops were sleeping around him. Abishai said to David, God has put your enemy in your power tonight. Now let him plunge his own spear let through. Me. Let me. Let me plunge their own spear through him and pin him to the ground with just one blow. I won't have to strike twice. Verse nine, but David said, you must not harm him. The Lord will certainly punish whoever harms his chosen king. By the living Lord, David conti continued, I know that the Lord himself will kill Saul, either when his time comes to die a natural death or when he dies in battle. The Lord forbid that I should try to harm the one whom the Lord has made king. Yet, excuse me, let's take his spear and his water jar and go. So David took the spear and the water jar from his side, be, from just beside Saul's head, and he and Abishai left. No one saw it or knew that the, what had happened or even woke up. They were all sound asleep because the Lord had sent a heavy sleep on them all. Okay, well, you know what happened. Uh, I mean, here's a, here's a complete military group, a whole military camp, and David, <laughs> David, I mean, the God must have, had, must have been responsible for this. I mean, David and his, and his relatives there, sleeping in there, and there's the king. Okay. Where, where was the sentry? Yeah. Where was the guard? Yeah. Exactly. Someone, someone probably lost their head over that. <laughs> Why did David refuse to kill Saul when he could have? Should he all have learned something from that lesson? Of course, you know, after the next morning when they woke up, Saul's, David called, he's far away on a, a hill. He said, hey, Saul, where's your spear? Where's your water jug? Uh, rah, rah. They're right here. You want to send somebody over here to get them? Mm. Hadn't David been promised that he was to be the next king? Why didn't he just hasten that process and kill Saul? An example of failing to be patient was shown by the prophet Elijah. You remember that story? We know that in many ways Elijah was a great prophet who lived at a very difficult time in the northern kingdom of Israel opposing Ahab and Jezebel. He had to hide for three years. At first, and of course you remember Elijah, <laughs> the beginning of that story, I always, always chuckle when I think about this. Here's a guy, you know, a bush bumpkin, you know, from a remote area. He just marches along. He didn't, he didn't ask anybody any questions. He just marches over there, marches right into the king's chamber, past all the guards, went right up to the king and says, it's not going to rain for three years until I say so. Turns around, marches out, and 
<laughs> I mean, try to try to imagine that and get that man. Nobody can find him. Well, at first he hid by the brook Cherith, and finally he hid at Zarephath, under the nose of Jezebel's father, who was the king of Tyre and Sidon, and the great high priest of Baal. I mean, <laughs> you know, David, I mean, Saul had gone around, I'm, I'm sorry, saying Saul. Uh, Ahab had gone around to all the countries around. Where is this guy? Tell me where he is. I'll come and get him. I'll take care of him. So where is he hiding? <laughs> within a couple few miles of his wife's father who was the high priest of Baal and the king of Tyre and Sidon and what's Elijah doing he's over there in Zarephath just a short distance from them okay well then the day finally came when God told Elijah to go back to Judah and call for that encounter on the top of Mount Carmel and you know the story first Kings 18 Try to imagine Elijah's feelings after that encounter and after God consumed his offering by lightning from heaven, destroying the offering, the wood, the stones, and the water, and leaving a black hole in the ground. I mean, here's everybody watching, and suddenly, gazap! Wow. Then try to imagine how you would feel directing the instruction, the destruction and death of those 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah. We do not know how many of the, those prophets were killed by Elijah himself, but at least he was responsible for carrying out that mission. Well, after such an incredible day, he then guided the chariot of Ahab back to Jezreel through the heavy rain. You remember, he prayed for the rain. His, his servant saw a small cloud. He says, get ready. He went out there. He took, the, he had the raining so heavy, he had to lead the horse with his bridle. It is a well-known phenomenon that after incredible highs, many have incredible lows. Elijah demonstrated that. Sleeping outside of Jezreel, maybe with little or no rain, no cover in the rain, he was awakened and told that Jezebel had promised to kill him that day, 1 Kings 19, 1-9. Then Elijah, along with his servant, began to run. They covered many miles. Finally, Elijah was alone in a cave on Mount Horeb or Sinai. God appeared to him, asking him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Think how different things might have been if Elijah had stayed in Israel, not fearing the threats from Jezebel and carrying out evangelistic work, inspiring the people to follow up with their promise made on Mount Carmel. And yet, here's the, the prophet who finally, what happened to Elijah at the end? He's translated to heaven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Taken by he to heaven directly. Wow. There so are many. That, so is that what you think that Elijah should have done? He should have stayed there and evangelized. The people the said. The people said, you know, God, He is God. Uh, he, uh, Yahweh, He is God. Yahweh he is God. He should have stayed. Ellen White says so. Follow he up. should and followed up. There are many other stories in the Bible that illustrate the fact that people did not want to wait for God. Think about Sarah suggesting that Abraham take a secondary wife in order to produce a son for her. We've already mentioned that. Even Moses, after 40 years leading the children of Israel under very difficult circumstances, did not trust God's word to take the children of Israel into the land. Carrie? Reading from Numbers 20 verses 10 to 12. He and Aaron assembled the whole community in front of a rock. Moses said, Listen, you rebels, do we have to get water out of this rock for you? Then Moses raised the stick and struck the rock twice with it. And a great stream of water gushed out, and all the people and animals drank. But the Lord reprimanded Moses and Aaron. He said, because you did not have enough faith to acknowledge my holy power before the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land that I promised to give them. That's wow. The American Bible Society. Yeah. Holy Bible Good News Translation. Think about Samson, one of the famous judges. He demanded that his parents get a Philistine wife for him, and know what, we know what all that led to. On the other hand, Jesus was patient with the Samaritans when they refused to allow him to stay overnight in their village since he was going to Jerusalem, Luke 9, 52 to 56. 
And think of the story of Paul seeking out and arresting and even killing the followers of Jesus until he had that encounter on the road to Damascus. If we really delighted in the Lord and what he is doing, would we have a problem with exercising patience? There's a famous psalm in the Old Testament that teaches us some important lessons. Dwayne? Psalm 37, 1 to 11. Don't be worried on account of the wicked. Don't be jealous of those who do wrong. They will soon disappear like grass that dries up. They will die like plants that wither. Trust in the Lord and do good. Live in the land and be safe. Seek your happiness in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desire. Give yourself to the Lord. Trust in him and he will help you. He will make your righteousness shine like a noonday sun. Be patient and wait for the Lord to act. Don't be worried about those who prosper or those who succeed in their evil plans. Don't give in to worry or anger. It only leads to trouble. Those who trust in the Lord will possess the land, but the wicked will be driven out. Soon the wicked will disappear. You may look for them, but you won't find them. The humble will possess the land and enjoy prosperity and peace. Well, there's a lot of promises. Sounds good. If we recognize that our most important object in life is to fulfill God's will for us, would we have any trouble in taking delight in the Lord? In this psalm, David repeatedly encouraged us to have faith. Is there anything unreasonable about trusting God? There must Paul, be. Or more people would do it. Yeah. Paul, well, the choice is, do I, do I trust myself or do I trust God? Now, that's a problem. It seems like just trusting God would be an easy thing to do, but if the choice is between trusting God and trusting myself, then there's a problem. Paul, writing his last letter that we know about, said in 2 Timothy 1.12, Gordon? And it is for this reason that I suffer these things, but I am still full of confidence because I know whom I have trusted, and I am sure that he is able to keep safe until that day what he has entrusted to me from the Good News Bible. And right. Ellen White from Selected Messages, Book 2, the Lord is not pleased to have us fret and worry ourselves out of the arms of Jesus. More is needed of the quiet waiting and watching combined. We think unless we have feeling that we are not in, on the right track and we are not looking within for some sign befitting the occasion. But the we keep looking within. We keep looking. But the reckoning is not of feeling but of faith. Okay. Ellen White. What could we, as a local church or even a Sabbath school class, do to hasten the second coming? Is that possible? Yes. We are all awaiting the finishing of the three angels' messages so Jesus can come again. Shouldn't we or could we be doing more? Is it easy to believe that God will do the best thing for us at the best time ever? Myra? Second Peter 3, 10 to 13. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and on the day, on that day, the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise. The heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed. The earth with everything in it will vanish. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of, of God and do your best to make it come soon. Okay, hold on, wait, 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 what? Do your best to do what? To make it come soon. Do we have a part in hastening the second coming of Jesus Christ? Or delaying it. Or delaying it, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, the day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat but we wait for what God has promised, his heavens and new earth where righteousness will be at home, the Good News Bible. This week's lesson highlights two major themes. One, we understand that patient waiting is part of the fruit of the Spirit and is crucial in our overcoming crucibles. Two, 
Waiting patiently becomes possible when we know and trust the person we are waiting for. From our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 145. <clears throat> If our goal as Christians is to become partakers of the character of God and his divinity, which was stated so many times by Ellen White and suggested by the Bible, what do we need to know about the patience of God? What does it mean to become a partaker of the divine nature? Hmm. That would be really something. Charles, you want to? One biblical expression that describes God's patience is slow to anger. Nehemiah 9, 16, 17, Exodus 34, 6, Nehemiah, Numbers 14, 18, Psalms 108, verse 8. Most of these texts place the expression slow to anger in the context of other divine descriptions, such as God is abundant in long suffering, loving kindness, compassionate and gracious, merciful. In addition, the Bible presents God as putting up with people, Genesis 18, 17 to 30. A lot of passages there, go yes. ahead. Shall I read them all? No. No, okay. Um, at the same time, God is abounding and goodness and truth, and is the author of wondrous deeds. At the same time, he's by no means clears the guilty. Okay, that's from our Bible study guide for page 145 again. Could we survive at all if God were not slow to anger? There's nothing wrong with God's ability, His omniscience, His omnipresence, or His omnipotence. But He does not always do exactly what we think He should do at exactly the time we think He should do it. Second Peter suggests that one of the reasons he does not is because he's waiting for as many people as possible to be saved. Romans 2.4 is another example. Let's look at that. Or perhaps you despise his great kindness, tolerance, and patience. Surely you know that God is kind because he's trying to lead you to repent. And Second Peter again, Jim? Second Peter 3, 9 and 10. 9 and 15. The Lord, is not, excuse me, the Lord is not slow to do what he has promised, as some think. Instead, he is patient with you because he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants all to turn away from their sins. Is that going to happen? Is everyone going to turn away from their sins? No. no. God wants that to happen. He made provisions for it, but it's not going to happen. Verse 15. Look on our Lord's patience as the opportunity he is giving you to be saved, just as our dear brother Paul wrote to you, using the wisdom that God gave them. Good News Bible. We as a church have chosen as one of our primary components of our name that we are Adventists. That means we are looking forward to the second coming, the Advent. Are we looking forward patiently or impatiently? <laughs> We need to answer that question before we move on. <laughs> Are we waiting patiently or impatiently? We're waiting. We're waiting, okay. Carrie, because we don't have any choice, right? The Bible teaches that patience is an integral part of Christian life and comes from God. God clothes us with patience together with mercy, humility, and meekness. Because Christ is all and in all. And that's from Colossians 3.11, New King James Version. And because God has elected, and that's in inverted commas there, elected us, see, what's that, Colossians 3.12, Jesus works in us his patience, 1 Timothy 1.16. We are patient because of the calling that God extended to us. Ephesians 4, 1, 2, 2, 2 Timothy 4, 2. Christian patience is part of the fruit produced by the Holy Spirit. And that's coming from Galatians 5, 22, I guess. Yes. It comes in a package with other Christian virtues such as love, hope, and meekness. It's from Galatians 5, 22. Galatians Et cetera. 
Yes, etc. And our hope enables us to wait with patience, as Romans 8.25. We are strengthened through patience with joy, Colossians 1.11. And patience produces character, Romans 5.3.4, James 1.3. It's from the Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide 146. In many places, Paul encouraged us to be humble and patient. He taught that there was no difference between Jews and Gentiles. He admitted that he was a prisoner because of the Lord. Duane? Patience is a key characteristic of the end time remnant of God. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. From Revelation 14, 12, New King James Version. The remnant understand that they must be patient until the coming of the Lord in the same way that a farmer is patient until the harvest is ready. And lots of verses for that. We take courage from God's injunction to Habakkuk that even if, at times, certain end-time prophecies may appear to be far from their final fulfillment, we must persevere in our waiting. The vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the time, at, at, but at the, the end. end, it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, and it will not tarry. God calls us to be still and know that I am God. David insists that a believer must learn to wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Okay, so in Revelation and thir Revelation 13 and 14, and Revelation 14, of course, is the, the one chapter in the Bible where we get the three angels' messages, which we believe is our final message for the world, right? And in those two chapters, we find out that there's a war going on between heaven, between Satan and, and heaven, between and God. And it calls multiple times in those two chapters for patience. We see that the final plans that the devil has to defeat God's people. Then we see God's response. In both chapters, it is stated unequivocally that God's faithful people will have to endure keeping the commandments of God and being faithful to God. How patient are we at waiting for the second coming? Are we just lying around l relaxing? Are we hoping it will happen without our assistance? Hmm. From the Teacher's Bible Study Guide, page 147. In the meantime, an entire cloud of witnesses in patience cheers us on the way. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, <clears throat> and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, <clears throat> who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Okay, let's, let's interrupt there for just a second. This partially quoted from Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, and the great cloud of witnesses, who are those people? The saints. Yeah. All the saints, but specifically, this is the, these are the faithful in Hebrews 11, the faith chapter. He says, look at all these examples you have of faith, okay? What are you going to do about it? Okay, go ahead. Among the great examples of patience are Abraham and the prophets and Job, who prove that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Jeremiah decided to wait on the Lord no matter what I say to myself. The Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. <clears throat> because the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Again, from the Bible Study Guide. Certainly no one is a greater example of patience and hope and endurance than was Jesus himself. Think how he endured everything that was thrown at him in those last few days of his life on this earth. When Jesus was born, Satan was determined to overcome him in some way or other. Uh, how many people had lived on this earth up to that time without sinning? None. None. 
None. Not one. So Satan said to all his buddies, what? We're going to get this baby to sin, right? His first plan was to get Jesus to sin. As Jesus was approaching the final events of his ministry, Satan began to realize that he had not accomplished that goal. He hadn't caused Jesus to sin yet. Then Satan decided that he would make things as difficult as possible for Jesus so that while he may not actually commit a sin, I'm sorry, commit, yeah, commit a sin, he would abandon his mission to this earth and return to heaven. So, okay, he, he can't get him to sin, so what is he going to ask him to do next? Make things really difficult. Jesus doesn't have to sin. What does he need to do? Give up. Just, just give up this crazy notion of trying to save the world. Go back to heaven. Leave them. Leave them, of course, to him, to Satan. Satan failed in that respect as well. Jesus was not hindered in any way from proceeding all the way to his death on the cross and his burial in the tomb. At that point, Satan and his angels were getting desperate. They did everything they possibly could to keep that grave shut. But two angels came from heaven, the ones who had been his guardian angels all his life. It's interesting Ellen White suggests that, um, if you put the pieces together, that God realized that Satan, I mean, think about, Herod back at the beginning wanted to kill the baby Jesus. He was doing everything he possibly could to get rid of him, so God gave him two guardian angels. Uh, when they showed up accompanied by God's glory, Satan and his angels had no choice but to scatter. The hundred Roman soldiers lay as if dead on the ground, and Jesus came forth from the grave in his own power. And how are we doing with waiting? Um, let me just read this quickly. Yes, there are practical aspects of patience for this life, for its opposite, impatience ruins our present lives and makes us fools. But patience is that virtue that God gives us in the crucible of the tribulation that helps us overcome and secure eternal life. In his teaching about tribulation in the world, Jesus instructs us, by your patience, possess your, you, uh, by your patient, possess your souls, and I'm running out of time here. If we had opportunity to ask your family and friends about your patience, what would they lay, teach us about you? Think about it. We, uh, that's the question we leave for you. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, patience is such a challenge. It's a difficult thing for us. It's not easy for us. We are born impatient. As little babies, we don't even have any idea of patience. They want, we want things to happen for us, whatever our needs are right now. But Lord, we know that it is your plan for us to grow patience, to learn patience, and to be, to, to learn that, to wait patiently for you. We believe you're coming soon. The Lord, help us to have patience, the right kind, to prepare for that day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.